Today's webinar is entitled Data Protection, California's CCPA and the EU's GDPR, what US and European companies need to know, especially as companies and their staff go virtual for an indefinite amount of time. And it is brought to you by the European American Chamber of Commerce, where Europeans and Americans connect to do business. We have right now uh, about 40 different attendees uh, from across the United States and Europe. So I'm sure we're gonna have a very vibrant transatlantic and international discussion. So with that, let me introduce our panelists. First is Kate Black. She is a shareholder with Greenberg Traurig who focuses on data privacy and information protection. She's joining us from Miami today. <coughs> today, excuse me. Brian Kent is an attorney with Cozen O'Connor based in Philadelphia, and he works in the, their, their data privacy and security practice. <coughs> And finally, connecting from Paris is Cecile Martin, the managing partner of the Paris office of Ogletree Deacons. She started her career at the French Data Protection Agency and is a member of the European Advisory Board of the International Association of Privacy Professionals. And with that, Kate, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you, Todd. Appreciate that introduction. As Todd mentioned to all the participants, please feel free to ask questions throughout the conversation. We'd like to make this as interactive and as useful as possible. It's, uh, it's nothing short of an interesting time, just when we thought privacy couldn't be changing more rapidly between regulations and guidance and new laws being passed. We all were shocked with the news of COVID-19 and are now shuffling to respond to that as well. So we thought this webinar would be incredibly timeful, timely to put together some of these pieces so that every business and every in-house council can figure out how to navigate this incredibly complex and challenging landscape. We're going to start today by talking a little bit about the topic du jour uh, and how businesses are responding to COVID-19, both by moving their uh, operations remote as well as managing the information collection needed to properly report and manage any sort of uh, positive test results in their organization. And then we'll kind of jump into weeding through all of the guidance and changes that have developed to really identify what are the key changes that businesses should be aware of uh, as they are working remotely during this time? And how, uh, how does our horizon look? What changes are coming down the pipeline that we could all you know, make sure that we're keeping top of mind so that we can scrape through all the newsletters we're getting in our inbox uh, and focus on what's really important. So with that, I'd love to hear uh, from both you, Cecile and Brian, what, uh, what do you think the key privacy fundamentals are and privacy law requirements are uh, for businesses who are responding to the COVID-19 crisis, both uh, guidance for how to move employees to telework, as well as information collection practices for their employees. Uh, thank you, Kate. Uh, if I may start with the uh, European aspect of this question, I would say that uh, at the moment, um, the main issue for companies is to try to find the right balance, of course, between uh, the necessity to pursue the business as usual, if at all possible, of course, and to preserve the security of the employees. So for doing that, uh, we have a lot of recommendation with respect to um, of course, uh, how to continue the business, how to use the bring your own device uh, policies of the company, making sure that people can uh, work uh, with, uh, you know, kind of security uh, when dealing with personal data of employees, of customer, this kind of things, because people are not, you know, uh, using sometimes uh, the devices of the company, but their own devices. So that may be an issue, of course, of security. But also we can see that that uh, mini DPA, I would say data protection agency in Europe, really focus on one issue, which is the possibility for employers to uh, collect health data of their employees or their visitor in order to decide whether or not they can enter into the premises when they are still open. And this is clearly a main issue in Europe because uh, we do not have uh, clear guidance on this point from several member states, and we do not have any consensus at the open level on this point. Uh, because as you may know in Europe, uh, health data are very sensitive data and therefore normally uh, as an employer you are not supposed to collect this kind of data or in a very limited you know purpose and all the question arising with the pandemic is of course to uh, try to determine uh, whether or not it will be proportional 
for uh, employers to um, collect this kind of data and how to store them, what would be the legal basis to collect this kind of data and uh, what kind of security measures should be implemented in order to make sure that third party are not going to uh, have access to this kind of very sensitive data. And when we look at different European countries, we can see that, for instance, in France for the moment, the uh, guidance from the French Data Protection Ag Agency, the CNIL, is that employers should refrain from uh, collecting um, health data like symptoms from their employees. They should refrain from collecting information on whether or not they have been exposed to the virus uh, because French Data Protection Agency consider that it is not proportional. But we are pretty sure that this position is going to evolve with the pandemic because we can see that a lot of Europe country which had the same vision at the CNIL have decided to change their mind and have authorized the collection of this kind of specific data and that's the case for instance in Italy where we had exactly the same approach that in France stating that it was not clearly recommended to start collecting this kind of data because they are too much sensitive and finally there has been a kind of agreement between the trade unions and the government 15 days ago allowing employers to collect health data and to uh, make sure that employees entering into the premises of the company were not exposed to the coronavirus. So, of course, it is really, really regulated because uh, the Italian Data Protection Agency clearly requires that employers do not record the temperature unless necessary to document that an employee was not allowed to enter into the premises. It is also necessary to inform the data subject that we are going to collect this kind of very specific data. And also employers need to make sure that they have implemented specific security measures in order to store those specific data. But uh, we can see that also in Ireland, the Irish Data Protection Agency has decided that it was justified for companies to ask employees and visitors to inform uh, the, the company if they have visited a very specific and affected area or if they have experienced uh, symptoms. So what we can see in Europe at the moment is that uh, there is no consensus, uh, but at least there is a willingness to collect at least the data in a very limited um, type of data. I mean, uh, really the principle of the GDPR, which is the minimization of the data, is really, you know, uh, the main point of the uh, data protection agency at this time, because even if they authorize the collection of this kind of data, they require that companies collect the minimum of data. And uh, I will uh, add that at the European level, we have what we call the EDPB. This is the European Data Protection Board, which gather all the French data protection, uh, all the uh, European data protection agencies at the European level. And um, this EDPB issued two different guidelines in three days. Uh, the first one in March 16, uh, where it says that, um, of course, nothing in the GDPR prevents from collecting health data, but that it should be done for specific purposes like vital interest of the data subject or for ills um, public authorities or if there is specific legislation which authorizes companies to do that. And in a new guidance issued on March 19, um, the DPB clearly stated that um, employers could collect this kind of data only if there was a specific national law allowing them to collect it. So we can see that in order to determine which kind of data can be collected in Europe, companies need to rely on the various data protection laws in order to see whether or not a specific legislation has been implemented. I, uh, yeah, I, so I think there's a kind of a similar thing in US privacy law. So it's US privacy law is primarily you know, a balancing act between privacy interests and other interests. So, you know, maybe economic interests or public health or privacy interests of other individuals. So companies right now really just have to walk that line. They have to respect the privacy 
of their employees uh, while at the same time protecting their employees' health and safety. So, uh, you know, if, if an employee uh, discloses that they have been, uh, they've tested positive uh, for coronavirus, the company has to take action to protect its other employees. But when they do that, they should just uh, maintain the confidentiality of the employee tested positive as much as possible. So, uh, you know, they shouldn't be disclosing that person's name, but, uh, you know, at the same time, they, uh, you know, can just make a general announcement to other people that person may have come in contact with um, that they may have been exposed. And there are some provisions in U.S. law that, uh, that would cover this situation. So, for example, HIPAA, which regulates uh, protected health information, has uh, certain exceptions for the disclosure of health information uh, to present, prevent serious and imminent threat or uh, in the interest of the public health. So, uh, you know, there are ways uh, in U.S. law that this information can kind of be collected and disclosed uh, to public health authorities for the purposes of um, avoiding the spread of the, of the virus. And just a quick note on employees going uh, remote or working virtually. That can be a bit of an information governance nightmare from a uh, you know, privacy perspective uh, or and just a data security perspective. So anytime you disperse operations, you have the potential that employees will be, for example, saving information locally on their own laptop rather than saving it to a centralized document repository per company policies. They may email send emails to their personal email address for example if they don't have their if they have a company issued laptop but it's not uh, connected to their printer they may email to their home email address so that they can print a document they may trans try to transfer documents via uh, usb drives and other removable media that um, it's just their personal devices and can be infected with malware so it's just important for companies to reiterate to their employees as they go uh, as they move virtually that you know, company information governance policies are still in place, acceptable use policies are still in place, and just make sure that employees are vigilant in uh, adhering to company policies. When uh, if employees go virtual, if, especially if they're, uh, you know, they're not used to it, it's employees that typically come into the office, uh, they may, as I said, take certain shortcuts to, uh, that they think is necessary to get their job done. Um, so it's just important for companies to, to tell those employees, look, we understand there might be some growing pains as we move virtually, but it's, it's really important that you uh, continue to adhere to the company's information governance policies, privacy policies, acceptable use policies with respect to the uh, use of remote technologies. Thank you both. It seems as though we're all moving very rapidly to navigate some of this guidance and best practices. As we're all settling into remote work this week, have you all seen international companies that are operating both in the US and the EU develop any best practices or trends um, that we should be aware of? Uh, I would say yes. Um, of course, a lot of companies need to navigate with different legislation with respect to uh, this specific situation. Um, uh, I would say that uh, even if the legislation may differ from one country to another one and that um, the company needs to make sure that uh, it is in compliance with the local laws, uh, several uh, things need to uh, be implemented in order to make sure that uh, they will be in compliance with almost all uh, their jurisdiction of implementation. And uh, the main thing is, of course, to uh, make sure that in every location, um, you have an information of notice of the employees, of the um, the visitor with respect to the new data uh, which are collected by uh, the business and the new purpose of uh, the collect. I mean, if the company decide to implement a business continuity plan, or if the company decide to um, implement virtual desk to uh, work remotely, uh, of course, uh, employees and visitor needs to be aware that specific data may be collected in this purpose. The second thing, if you are in Europe, is of course to make sure that you are going to update uh, 
your record of processing of activities because you have new data processing. So that means that you need to update your registry. Uh, the third one, still if you are in Europe, is to carry out perhaps a data privacy impact assessments, which is requirements when you are dealing with a vulnerable data subject and in Europe an employee is considered as a vulnerable data subject and when you are dealing with sensitive data and his data of course uh, are sensitive data. Also which something which is totally universal is to make sure that you have implemented all the necessary security measures, I will say at the technical and organizational levels, uh, in order to make sure that third parties are not going to access to the personal data of the company. And then if you have to transfer personal data from, uh, let's say, uh, the EU to the US, making sure that your international transfer are uh, secure, uh, either by the privacy shield or by standard contractual clauses, in order to avoid, you know, any uh, issue with the transfer of data from the EU to the US because as you know the EU do not consider the US as being an adequate country uh, with respect to privacy. Uh, the EU Commission consider that um, uh, only a limited uh, number of countries in the world can be considered as adequate countries so that means that for the US uh, you need to make sure that you have implemented a specific contract or binding corporate rules if you are a group or the privacy shield in order to transfer uh, the, the data from uh, Europe to the US. And I would say that as a practical tips, of course, and the main point is to make sure that um, you are going to be able, and I know that it is quite challenging at this time because it changes almost every hour in Europe, uh, you are going to be aware of any new uh, guidance or legislation because for the moment is very local, so it's not at the open level. So it means that for each location in Europe, uh, businesses need to be aware of what's going on and uh, also to document each decision that you are going to take with respect to this in order to be able to justify your decision in case of control by your local data protection agency. So I the best advice that I can give to companies is just kind of stay the course. Uh, as I said, these, you know, these privacy laws are still in place. Um, you know, companies who are doing the right thing, they should have contingency plans in place that uh, would cover this situation. For example, a disaster recovery plan where uh, perhaps a, a, a physical office is closed uh, or is destroyed by fire or something along that nature. Um, so they should just activate those contingency plans. Uh, it's a good time to go through them as they're activating them and see what parts of them make sense for the situation we're in, what parts don't make sense, uh, and just roll out the contingency plans that they already have in place. And it's also a good idea for companies, it's really important that they document if there's any, if there's any particular changes to policies or practices, uh, as I said, as they're going through these contingency plans and they say, this just doesn't make sense, um, we need to change this. Uh, it's just important that they document the thought process. As I said, privacy law in the U.S. is largely a balancing act. Um, so uh, the companies need to show that they, uh, show the thought process that they went through the balancing act and they say, okay, here's the privacy interests we have in place, or I'm sorry, here's the privacy interests that are, that are affected. Um, you know, here's the interests on the other side, and here's kind of the balancing that we're going to do, and then here's the ultimate conclusion. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, if, if uh, a regulator comes to the company and says, hey, we think you're out of compliance with this privacy law, it's important for the company to be able to show the regulator, look, this is what we thought, uh, you know, this is the conclusion we came through. But it's important to show that thought process to, you know, mitigate any potential penalties. Uh, or at the very least show that it's not it, it's not a, a willful violation. So the company wasn't just disregarding the privacy interests of its customers or its employees, but it was taking them into account and went through a very deliberate thought process uh, to come to its conclusion. So it, it, that's really the best practice that, that you know, I can give companies is to, you know, just stay the course to the best that they can. And if they're going to make any changes where uh, privacy, in, uh, privacy uh, interests may be affected, they just need to thoroughly go through the thought process and document that thought process. 
those were some really helpful pieces of guidance, uh, especially for individuals who are managing compliance programs. This is obviously um, a big impact for the day-to-day -day of employees as well, um, and they're already dealing with so many disruptions and changes. Do you guys have any advice for um, minimizing the impact to the daily business uh, of the employee and how uh, companies can realistically minimize having to retrain all of their employees in response uh, to the co-working environment? I would say that it really depends on each company uh, and uh, you know the, the way the company is used to operate. Um, but what we can see at the moment, at least in Europe, is that uh, it's really important to um, be able to continue to follow internal policies in order to make sure that um, people feel comfortable working from home, that everyone is efficient in the way it should uh, work from home, uh, that everyone has, you know, um, specific devices to be able to provide um, work from home because, of course, um, it is not always the case. And what we have observed over the last days was that company needed sometimes in order to provide, you know, IT uh, devices to all their employees, be able to parameter everything in order for them to uh, to work remotely. Um, but um, the main point at the time is the organization, of course, as you are not face to face, sometimes it's very difficult uh, to work uh, remotely. But um, what we have observed at this, at this time is that uh, employers have required to their employees to try to set up meetings uh, almost every day, every morning, in order to uh, see whether or not they are uh, facing any specific issue. And they have also reminding them how they uh, should behave when working uh, remotely and what kind of precaution they should uh, uh, comply with with respect to uh, the handle of personal data uh, because uh, a lot of uh, employees may have of course to deal with uh, personal data during their uh, work day and therefore it is really odd the uh, you know, responsibility, liability of the company to make sure that they are going to manipulate this personal data with all the security measures ne needed. Thank you, Cecile. I think, I don't know about the two of you, but I've certainly already just seen rumblings that we may see a reduction in enforcement actions by data protection regulatory authorities, both here in the US, for example, in California under the CCPA, uh, or in the EU as uh, governments look to focus on disease response and information protection. It's obviously anybody's guess at this point and things are evolving so quickly. I would love to hear your take on whether or not you think uh, regulatory enforcement actions and the finalization of guidance and regulations will be impacted by disease response. Uh, for the moment, um, what I can say is that for the French regulator, they have suspended, you know, their helpline. So that means that they do not answer anymore to the questions of the users. Um, they didn't mention anything with respect to the kind of control that they could conduct during the uh, pandemic. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that, of course, everything is slowed down given the situation in France because we are under containment measures. Uh, but what one thing that businesses need to uh, take into account is that the French Data Protection Agency is entitled to conduct control, uh, you know, um uh, on a virtual basis, if I may say, because they can uh, create um, a, an ID in order to enter into a system and check whether the system is in compliance with the GDPR. So that means that you do not need to be, you know, in the premises of the company to conduct a control. So that's the things that uh, businesses need to be aware of. And I'm pretty sure that if control are a little bit, you know, um, slow down at the moment. Uh, at the end of the crisis, uh, the uh, regulator is going to be, you know, very cautious, making sure that companies do not store any more ill data of the employees or of the visitors. So I'm pretty sure that they are going to, you know, scrutinize a little bit what has been done in the company in order to make sure that at least what was perhaps, you know, uh, authorized in a very limited basis and very temporary basis is not going to be you know something which is going to continue after the pandemic 
And I know that for the ICO in the UK, for instance, uh, they have clearly expressed that they will not, you know, uh, pursue company during the pandemic uh, because they consider that uh, companies do not have sometimes the possibility to comply with specific, you know, time frame required by the GDPR. And for instance, they consider that if a controller does not reply to a data subject request in the one month time frame, they are not going to take any action against the company. So, yes, I've been asked that question quite a bit here over the past couple of days, and it, it always makes me curious, you know, if I say no, I don't think these are going to be enforced. Does that mean the company's not going to comply? Um, and it's always a risk, right? As you said, Kate, uh, it's anybody's guess uh, how things are going to shake out. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's always a risk if you decide, well, we don't think this is going to get enforced right now because there's other things that are higher priority. So we're just going to kind of push compliance to the back burner. That's always a risk. And I wouldn't advise that. I think the biggest um, priorities are certainly changing. I think the biggest issue in the United States as far as enforcement right now is court closures. So the uh, the attorneys general, the, it, for U.S. privacy laws, they're generally enforced through civil actions in the courts. Right now, a lot of state courts, uh, federal courts are shutting down or at least severely curtailing their operations to things uh, that they consider emergency matters. So uh, you know, injunctions, protection from abuse acts uh, and things of that nature. And they're just, they're not going to have the capacity in the short term to uh, entertain enforcement actions for violations of privacy laws. Now, that being said, there is a uh, statute of limitations on privacy laws. The attorneys general can certainly look back and see what companies did in this period once courts start to open back up and use that as a basis for enforcement actions. And I think that the attorneys general certainly do that. I think it's uh, either this isn't a free pass for companies. The, uh, the regulators may be a little bit more sympathetic uh, to uh, the extraordinary measures that our companies are having to take to maintain operations, but they're not going to just give companies a free pass and say, well, we understand this was an unprecedented situation. And so we know you didn't comply with this law, but we're just going to kind of excuse that. So I think that the, uh, the, the pandemic may be a mitigating circumstance, but I certainly don't think it's going to, uh, to uh, cause regulators to just turn a blind eye to this. And as I said, once things, uh, once things kind of uh, shake out, the regulators can look back to this time and see how companies um, abided by privacy laws. Um, so I think the, the answer is in the short term. I don't think there's going to be a lot of enforcement, but, uh, you know, over the course, uh, you know, towards the later part of the year, as things uh, hopefully stabilize, I think companies can expect that the regulators will be pretty aggressive and looking back and seeing what companies did during this period and, and whether or not they uh, complied with the applicable regulation. Thank you both. It's, um, it's interesting to hear. It seems like both jurisdictions are really advising clients to stay the course, maintain your compliance operations in the EU in particular. If there's significant changes uh, to the, your data collection and processing activities, make sure to document those and perform the appropriate impact assessments. Um, in the US, though, staying the course and maintaining compliance gets to be a little bit more complicated. Uh, our primary data protection law in California, for example, have not even finalized their regulations yet. So I think it'd be helpful, Brian, if you could give us an update on where the California process is and what we can expect, um, not only from the latest round of updates to the draft regulations, but when they will be finalized and if more changes are expected. Sure, so the, uh, the California Attorney General put up put out updated uh, draft regulations earlier this month. Uh, they were open for public comment. The, the comment period ends a little bit later this week. Uh, and then the Attorney General will look at those comments and decide whether to make any additional changes. And then we'll, we'll publish updated uh, regulations or we'll put out uh, a final, final draft. Uh, I, even back in, you know, end of last year when the first draft regulations came out in October. I kind of figured it would be the spring till everything got finalized. So I figured, you know, sometime in March or April, uh, obviously that now is, is it's going to be April at the earliest. Uh, I think with COVID-19, it may be, um, it may be May till we see the final regulations. But 
the enforcement starts June 1st. I think there's going to be a real push to get everything finalized before June 1st and hopefully well in advance of June 1st. Uh, that's been one of the key issues, as you said, Kate, with compliance companies say, you know, we need more time to be able to implement uh, uh, our, you know, operational uh, procedures and policies. Once we see the final regulations, I think the, uh, the other side of that is, uh, you know, th while things are changing, they're uh, kind of changing on the margins. There's not huge changes to the substance of the regulations and, uh, and the law is still the law, right? So the, the regulations are just kind of filling in some of the gaps of the law, but the, uh, the actual CCPA um, you know, hasn't changed. Uh, it hasn't changed recently. It was amended uh, quite a few times, uh, but at this point, the text of the law is what the text of the law is. So, um, it, so I, I don't wanna say that complaint has fallen on deaf ears, but at this point, there's been no rumblings of pushing back the enforcement deadline. There may be, depending on how long it takes these regulations to, uh, uh, to shake out. I will say that one of the uh, one of the biggest changes of the draft regulations that came out earlier this month. Uh, so the, the definition of personal information in the in the statute is uh, information that is reasonably capable of being linked to a particular individual or consumer or household. In the regulations that came out in February, there was an uh, an example. Uh, set out that said for IP addresses, um, you, you know, the key of whether an IP address falls into the definition of personal information is whether it's, it can be reasonably linked to a particular individual uh, or household. Uh, it really wasn't very helpful just because it uh, didn't really spell out what makes it uh, to be reasonably linked, right? Where's the line of reasonableness? So, for example, um, you know, a company may collect IP addresses, but it doesn't necessarily know who, who's, who those are linked to, but it could get information from an ISP that would have that information. And that line really wasn't uh, set out. In the updated regulations that came out in March, that example was, was deleted. It was taken out. Um, so it's even less clear now where that line falls. And it's a very important question because um, one of the threshold requirements of whether CCPA, CCPA is applicable to, to a company uh, is whether it collects personal information on more than 50,000 consumers. Uh, I have clients who, for example, run e-commerce businesses that, you know, they, they, their website is accessible from California and they may ship a limited number of uh, product to California. And of course, if they uh, if they transact with somebody in California, they have to collect their name, their address, uh, payment information to ship the product, and things of that nature, which is very clearly personal information. But they don't meet that threshold as far as products actually uh, sold in California. But they can look at their website analytics and see that they have hundreds of thousands of unique hits uh, a year from California IP addresses. So if that IP address is considered personal information, they would reach the threshold, but if it's not, um, they would not, and the CCPA isn't even applicable to them. Uh, so as I said, it's a very important question, and at this point, it's a bit of a mystery as to why that uh, example was added in February and then taken out in, uh, in March. Uh, so I think that's something that's probably not going to get clarified until there's enforcement actions uh, or until the AG notifies people that uh, you know, he believes that the, the law complies because they collect IP addresses or it may be um, similar to you know, the EU as far as where's the company positioned uh, in the sense of how it can link that IP address to an individual consumer. Is it data that has to come from a third party? Is it data that the company has internally but is just stored somewhere else? And they don't, as a practical matter, make the link, but they could. Um, so it, when I, that's a pretty glaring change to me in what came out in March, and it makes me think that uh, it's still a fairly unsettled issue, and it's it's going to take um, some enforcement actions to get some clarity on it. Thanks, Brian. In that vein, uh, do you think that the comment period or any of the timelines for the draft regulations or enforcement under the CCPA will change or be delayed? 
Uh, I don't believe they will be. So the, the, the way the common period works is it's just, it's a continual series, right? So anytime there's uh, changes, if they're considered minor changes, it's a 15 day comment period of their figure. If they're considered major changes, it's 45. Um, so there may just be some additional rounds of comments and there may be a bit of uh, a bit more of delay between the end of the comment period until the AG um, publishes the revised draft uh, regulations based on the comments just for, uh, from a standpoint of, you know, they're moving operations remotely as well. I'm sure there's a bit of a, a shuffling around of resources and, um, you know, they're in the same boat as everybody else trying to figure out how to keep things operating efficiently uh, from a virtual environment. So I think there may be a longer delay before we see the, the new draft come out, but I don't think we'll see an extension of the comment period. Thanks. That was a really helpful update on the latest and greatest on the CCPA. If we turn to Europe, it's uh, no less quick moving and complicated. Uh, one thing that I think has been top of mind for companies operating both jurisdictions is the impact of Brexit. Um, as we move kind of through the Brexit process, Cecile, what do you think the impact will be from a data protection perspective? Um, it's difficult to say uh, at this time because, as you know, uh, we've got an agreement with the United Kingdom with respect to the Brexit. And for the moment, until the end of this year at least, and even after, if it is uh, uh, prorogated, uh, the UK is still part of the EU. So that means that, uh, I would say from a legislative point of view, so that means that for the moment the GDPR still apply and it applies until the end of this year. So we do not see any specific, you know, modification, of course, for the moment. But uh, at, uh, from 1st of January of next year, of course, uh, normally we should be in a position where GDPR will no longer apply to the UK, except, of course, if uh, UK businesses are targeting EU, EU residents or if they uh, sell goods and services to uh, EU residents. Because in such a case, it is, you know, as for any other uh, jurisdiction, the ter territorial scope of uh, the GDPR is going to apply and that means that you need to comply with it. But uh, for all data processing which are going to be uh, put in place in the UK after uh, 1st of January 2021, uh, normally the British law is going to apply to this kind of data processing. And I would say that businesses need to uh, be very cautious on one point at least, is that if they are used to deal with, you know, European country, they need to make sure that if there is no, at this time, an adequacy decision from the European Commission, uh, you know, recognizing the UK as a country having an adequate level of protection according to uh, European standards, it means that company will have to make sure that any transfer of personnel from the EU to the UK is going to be secure by one of the legal tools implemented by the GDPR, I mean the standard contractual clauses, uh, binding corporate tools, or this kind of things. So I will say that for the moment there is not a lot of changes on this point, but businesses need to uh, really focus on what's going on. And if the UK is not considered as an adequate country uh, next year, they should make sure to uh, secure their transfer to the uh, United Kingdom. Thank you for that update. It will be very interesting to see how the adequacy determinations uh, play out in that arena, certainly. Um, another big topic in the EU that uh, folks have been tracking quite closely is the finalization of the e-privacy regulation. Do we have any updates on that front? Uh, should we keep holding our breath or what are your thoughts, Cecile? Uh, for the moment, no, I do not have any specific, you know, information on where we are going on with, uh, with the e-privacy regulation. It's true and you're perfectly right. We are waiting for it uh, for a very, very long time now uh, because um, the idea is to try to align uh, the regulation of electronic communication with new GDPR requirements, of course, uh, to have a kind of cohesions uh, between, you know, e-privacy and GDPR. Uh, but uh, last October, um, 
a letter was sent by a lot of uh, representatives of different sectors to the Council of the European Union uh, requesting to review at the current proposal uh, because they considered that it was a source of legal uncertainty. Uh, and it's true that uh, the, the legislation, the regulation at this time is not very easy to understand and it's sometimes very complicated when you try to see how you could uh, implement it uh, in real life. So I have no estimation of uh, the timing for the finalization, but I'm afraid that with the current uh, you know, situation in Europe, uh, we are just going to postpone a little bit more uh, you know, uh, the implementation of the e-privacy regulation. Thank you, that's, that's helpful to know. Um, while I wish it would be finalized and we get some updates, I'm not surprised to hear there are none. Uh, turning a little bit now to more of an operational perspective, I think the name of the game right now for all companies is really prioritizing and using their resources as wisely as possible. Uh, for an organization that came into compliance with the GDPR, um, how much of that can they reuse for the CCPA? And if not, what are the kind of key priority topics that companies should look to use their privacy program resources for uh, in the coming months? Yeah, so from, uh, from what I've seen, companies that, are, that were already uh, GDPR compliant are very well positioned to, to come into compliance with CCPA. There are some uh, differences on the margins as far as what companies have to disclose uh, to, uh, to their uh, consum to consumers and their customers. But the, the, uh, the, the access rights, the deletion rights, things like that are largely the same. So, um, companies that have had that have the infrastructure in place to deal with um, DSARs under GDPR, they can very easily adapt that to fulfill requests under CCPA. They have to obviously train uh, the employees that are handling those requests to uh, to let so that they know what the um, what the rights are under the CCPA as compa compared to GDPR. Uh, there is a provision in uh, CCPA that requires a company to have a 1-800 number as a means for users to make consumers to make access requests and deletion requests. Um, so you know companies have been bringing that up, uh, bringing that online, and then just training the, the, the people who uh, monitor those lines as far as how to handle these requests. Um, but and then I said updating privacy policies. Companies have had to update their privacy policies. Uh, uh, a lot of times the, the GDPR privacy policy isn't adequate for CCPA purposes because the CCPA has uh, very specific, it sets forth certain categories of data, certain categories of uh, people that companies share data with, and they're required to disclose what data they collect and what data they share and who they share it with within the confines of those categories that are set forth in the regulation. Uh, they, that, that requirement is uh, different than GDPR. So companies have been adding their uh, specific, CCPA specific privacy policies um, to deal with those disclosures. But as I said, the infrastructure is largely in place uh, uh, to deal with, uh, to deal with uh, access requests and things of that nature. And I will add as well, I, I know um, after the uh, GDPR, uh, became it became effective. I know companies uh, experienced a deluge of access requests um, from uh, from data subjects. Uh, it, that, from my understanding, that was largely driven by plaintiffs bar because there's private right of action under GDPR. Uh, there's a private right of action under CCPA, but it's very more limited. It applies only to uh, a data breach. So uh, the the only enforcement provision for things like subject access requests is through the attorney general. So if a consumer uh, you know, goes to a company and says, hey, I want you to delete my uh, personal data and the company doesn't comply, the, uh, the data subject's uh, recourse is to go to the attorney general uh, and say they're not, um, they're not complying with my request, the attorney general. Then we'll look at it, they'll go to the company. The company has a 30 day cure period as well. So the attorney general can say, hey, we think you're in violation of CCPA. Uh, you need to fix it within 30 days or we're gonna bring in enforcement action. So then the company has the, op the opportunity uh, to fix the, uh, the violation. So, uh, you know, I think uh, 
companies aren't going to see uh, this huge increase in access requests, deletion requests, and things like that that we saw under GDPR simply because uh, there's no private right of action to recover damages uh, if the company doesn't comply. And, uh, you know, people uh, often say they care about privacy, but then, uh, you know, they don't act like they do. So, uh, you know, I, th I don't think there's going to be huge numbers of people that are just so interested in the data that companies have about them that there's going to be a significant increase in um, in requests. So, so the the pro policies, procedures, and the employees that people have in place to handle uh, requests under GPR should certainly be adequate to do the same under CCPA. And Cecile, I'd be curious to know your perspective, uh, how a global company could maintain uh, compliance with both uh, jurisdictional provisions, especially if you could talk a little bit about territorial scope and how each law uh, may be applied to a multinational company. Sure. Um, the territorial scope of the GDPR is very well defined at Article 3 of the GDPR. So uh, you are under the obligation to comply with it as a business if, of course, you have a company and establishment located in Europe. So as soon as you have something, you know, on the EU territory, you fall into the scope of the GDPR, regardless of whether the processing takes place in the EU or not. So this is clearly the specificity of the GDPR. You are also subject to the GDPR as a business. If even if you are not located in Europe, you are targeting um, EU residents. And by mentioning that it is EU residents, I really mean that it is not EU citizen. So it's any person living in the, uh, in the EU. And when you offer goods and services or that you monitor the behavior of uh, data subject residing in Europe, you are subject to uh, the GDPR. So it means that if we take a very concrete example, you are going to develop um, uh, a new application of car sharing, let's say, and you are a French company, but this application is going to be, you know, developed only in the US. So that means that you are going to collect only um, the personal data of a US resident, uh, and therefore you can wonder whether or not you are going to fall into uh, the GDPR. You are going to fall into the GDPR as soon as you are going to, you know, process the data in France. I mean, if for you running your application, you need to process the data in France or in Europe, that means that you fall into the scope of the GDPR, even if it's only personal data of US residents. So that's something that um, controller needs to uh, take into uh, consideration when launching their businesses, of course. And there is also a kind of extraterritoriality of the GDPR when a controller established in the EU is going to use a processor established, uh, you know, outside the EU because this processor is going to be under the obligation to comply with the GDPR requirements. So we can see that um, as I will say uh, uh, every law, uh, we have an extraterritoriality in the GDPR and sometimes it's quite complex for companies to try to comply with, you know, local legislation as well as European legislation uh, because you can have some kind of discrepancy with respect to requirements of both laws. And what I can suggest in such a situation, of course, is to assess on a case basis is this is what is the most favorable you know regime for the data subject trying to determine what is the law applicable to the processing in order to make sure that you comply as much as possible with uh, with the applicable law but i know that sometimes for global companies it's very difficult to make sure to comply with every aspect of the law Well, thank you both so much. This is incredibly interesting. I will uh, wrap up my questions as we get closer to the top of the hour with something of a lightning round. I'd love to hear from each of you what you think each company operating both the US and the EU should be thinking about. What are their three key priorities from a privacy perspective over the next six months? Um, it's not an easy question, but I will say that um, just continue to follow your checklist. I mean, uh, making sure that your information notices are, you know, updated, 
uh, that they comply with all the requirements of the law, that you have a policy of data subject access rights, because uh, in the EU, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, California, um, we are experiencing a lot of data subject requests uh, at the moment because people feel very concerned with their personal data. So business needs need to be aware of that and making sure that you have implemented specific provisions in the contract with your data processor, which are going to secure the transfer of personal data, especially if you have to transfer personal data from the EU to the uh, to other regions of the world, which are not considered as adequate by the European Commission. So I would say it's important, uh, now's a very important time for companies to uh, to go back and look at their data processing agreements. As I said, there's uh, uh, there are a few uh, things that are different between GDPR and CCPA. Uh, so GDPR has the concept of a controller and a processor. CCPA has the similar concept of the business, which is the uh, the entity that's directly regulated by the law, and then also service provider, uh, which is the, kind of along the lines of a processor for GDPR. Uh, DPAs that are in place are generally adequate for to cover the requirements uh, under CCPA between a business and a service provider. Uh, and from most of the DPAs that I've seen, there's also kind of a generic definition of privacy law that uh, would incorporate CCPA, but it doesn't mention CCPA specifically. So uh, now's a great time for companies to kind of look at their DPAs. Uh, I, they don't have to be generally rewritten uh, uh, to, to come into compliance with CCPA, but I just recommend that companies add a, an addendum that specifically incorporates CCPA by name rather than just relying on the generic definition of privacy law um, that's in the DPAs. Um, and and just fill in the gaps of what you know what uh, what CCPA requires. Um, as I said, I think generally the DPAs are sufficient, but it never hurts to specifically reference CCPA and the CCPA compliance uh, compliance requirements. So now would be a great time for companies to do that to make sure that uh, their current agreements also cover what they'll be required to do under CCPA. Thank you both so much. As uh, as I said, it's been wonderful talking to you. I would be remiss if I didn't give uh, some of our participants today uh, the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, one that we just got is from uh, Jeremy Mishkin. What do you both see happening with the development of the right to be forgotten here and in the EU? Um, the right to be forgotten, um, you know, is uh, a specific right implemented by the GDPR, but it was something that was already enforced in Europe, um, further to a decision of the European Court of Justice um, in 2014. And uh, just to give uh, new guidance about that, uh, one thing that needs to be uh, considered is that the uh, European Data Protection Board just issued uh, uh, a new guidance on the right to be forgotten in order to explain how it works, how it should be handled by businesses in order to comply with the GDPR. So this is something, you know, which is still, you know, under a lot of scrutiny from the different, uh, you know, actors of the of the European community because it's not always very easy to deal with this specific rights uh, because you need to make sure that you are not going, you know, of course, to put limits to the right by applying the right to be forgotten. So that's the reason why the EDPB issued new guidance about the right to be forgotten very recently. So in the US, uh, the, um, as I said, there's a, a, um, a right to have your deleted data, uh, your data deleted under CCPA. It's kind of, it's phrased strangely. It says that the consumer shall have the right to request that their data to be deleted. It doesn't um, say that they have the right to have it deleted. There's a number of exceptions uh, where a company uh, would not have to comply with a deletion request. Some of them are fairly broad and uh, severely limit the scope of what the right is. And I will also say, on, in uh, there's it's not clear what deletion means um, under the CCPA, and there's been some uh, contention among the regulated entities of what what that means. So 
Uh, you know, does it, is it just somehow rendering uh, the data in, unusable, taking it off production systems and things of that nature? Does it mean you know, actual physical erasure and destruction? I think that the, uh, the guidance comes out from, has come out from the AG is the later that it means no, it delete means delete. Um, but it's still not all, it's still not entirely clear where the scope of that right is and how broad the exceptions are. And as I said, the exceptions uh, have the potential to just swallow the right um, where companies can say, okay, you know, we get your request, uh, but we need this, uh, we, we're using this data to, we, we might need it to defend against a legal claim or we need it to, uh, we're using it in other lawful ways um, so we don't have to adhere to, to the request. So. The rights there, uh, I don't think it's, it's as well defined in the U.S. yet as it is uh, under European data protection law, um, but it's certainly getting there, and it's certainly something that's going to be incorporated uh, into more and more state privacy laws. Uh, you know, as more as more states enact CCPA-like, GDPR-like privacy laws, other than simply uh, data breach notification laws, which is the primary primary regulator of privacy. Um, in the U.S. right now. Well, thank you both so much. With everything going on in the world, I'm sure we could extend this topic uh, for many more hours and respond to many more questions. But certainly, uh, thank you to Todd and the EACC for the time here today. We look forward to staying engaged and uh, appreciate everyone's attendance. Thank you, Kate. That concludes today's webinar entitled Data Protection, California's CCPA and the EU's GDPR, what U.S. and European companies need to know, especially as companies and their staff go virtual for an indefinite amount of time. Thanks to our panelists, Kate Black, Brian Kent, and Cecile Martin for sharing their experience and insight. And thanks to all of you for joining in today's discussion. And I also wanna specifically point out, this is the first event of our chapter, our newest EACC chapter in Miami. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Christina, my counterpart there, did a fabulous job of uh, pulling this together and finding some excellent speakers. So I would encourage each of you to stay in touch with the, your local chapter of the European American Chamber of Commerce for information on upcoming webinars and events. And also be sure to look for a recording of this and other EACC webinars on our YouTube channel in the near future. Farewell. <laughs>